Well, welcome everybody to the Pando Days 2023 premieres. Really excited to see this project from US from the USC team uh, today as well. I'm Matthew Manos. I'm co-hosting these events with Eugene Shirley. And also, you know, we definitely want to remind you to check out the webpage for Pando Days 23 to see the premiere week schedule and also to see these 16 projects that have been developed. Earlier this morning, we heard from LA Trade Tech about shade structure designs for dealing with heat, and the teams were able to offer a suite of really beautiful options for that as well. And now we're <clears throat> moving a little bit across town to the University of Southern California with one of two Pando Day submissions from this university this year. As a reminder, all 16 of these events are recorded. These are these recordings along with the project materials will be available on each team's respective web page on the Pando website throughout the month um, as they come in as well. So look forward to continuous updates there. Recordings are then judged by a distinguished panel of specialists in the first quarter of the new year. And then on April 14th, we'll gather key people from across the whole of LA County in order to honor some of the best of these initiatives and do everything we can to help move them forward as well. Uh, we call that the Pando Sustainability Awards and it's gonna be held at Caltech. So uh, let's dive in with USC today and see what you all have been up to. Um, I should mention, Alex, it's it's nice to meet you. I'm a professor at Iavine and Young Academy, so not too far um, mm -hmm. from from the architecture school as well. Um, you all know our format uh, now is about 15 minutes for the presentation, and then we'll follow that up with another about 15 of Q&A from our expert panel as well. Uh, the UST team with us this morning is led by Professor Alexander Robinson, and this is the fourth season that USC has been involved in Pando Days, which is amazing. They've set a high bar, um, often winning submissions and projects that continue to le live on in the real world uh, once the semester class has ended. And this particular project we're going to hear about in a moment builds on the test plot concept premiered for us last year uh, and expands it into a fascinating new geographic area and also demonstrates the opportunities of scale as well. So, um, so Alex, I'm going to turn it over to you and team. Really excited to see what you all have been up to. Thank you so much, Matthew. And it's a pleasure to be here and to have this culminating moment. Um, I'm excited to have some of my students join us as well. And I'm going to give a presentation um, through a video that my students have recorded. So I think we'll just segue into that and then we'll lead into questions later. Thank you. Hello, so we are Test Plot, Catalina Island, Green Green. Our team is from the University of Southern California, and our site is located at the USC Berkeley Institute on Catalina Island. So the two LA Sustainability Plan goals we tried to meet were goal number five, thriving ecosystems, habitats, and biodiversity, which was the main goal we tried to meet. And then goal number 12, creative, equitable, and coordinated partnerships, which I will talk about briefly now. So with our partnerships, we wanted to emphasize having a diverse team of students and institutional partners. Our class is from the Lansing Architecture Program. We are Architecture 546 test plot. Um, we worked greatly with the Wrigley Institute for Environment and Sustainability and the Catalina Island Conservancy. Since our plot was located on Catalina at the Wrigley Institute, Wrigley staff helped us understand the hydrology of the specific site, as well as planning for the rock check dams. And then the Catalina Island Conservancy helped us with the plant selection process, choosing native and endemic species. And they also helped us on the planting day, providing over 100 plants for us. So what is our mission statement? It is, what if we thought of institutional landscapes as an opportunity for building new partnerships and models of stewardship and land conservation? With this test plot, we intend to build relationships to plants as ecological partners and sustainable solutions rather than just aesthetic consumable landscapes. And why is TESPOT more broadly? TESPOT is an ongoing hands-on experiment in community-based ecological restoration. Our purpose is to celebrate the labor involved in land care and build a stronger land ethic in our community. 
So our project site was located on Catalina Island, which is located about 22 miles off the coast of Long Beach. While many of you are likely familiar with Avalon, which you can see in the yellow circle down in the bottom, this test plot was completed on the USC Wrigley campus, which is located in Big Fisherman's Cove near two harbors, as seen in the red circle. The first signs of indigenous presence on the island go as far back as 7,000 years ago. Test plot and the USC Wrigley Institute for Environment and Sustainability acknowledges our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Tongva Gabrielino people and their neighbors. Indigenous stewardship and rightful claims to these lands have never been voluntarily relinquished nor legally extinguished. We pay our respect to the members and elders of these communities, past, present, and future, who remain stewards and advocates of this region. This acknowledgement was one of our guiding principles in developing this test plot. But our story starts 104 years ago, when the private island was purchased by William Wrigley, whose son, Philip K. Wrigley, donated the Wrigley Institute campus to USC in 1995. This test plot, which is located specifically within the Green Ravine on the campus, is an important site for drought mitigation and the marine protected area and adherence given its strategic location as a joining point for the uphill watershed. This area is not only ecologically important, but it is also in a high traffic area and provides the view for over half of all the housing on the campus, making it one of the most public facing areas. As a protected ecosystem, Catalina Island is incredibly unique and it was important that we supported that as we worked on this project. The island is home to 60 endemic plants and animals, which are species that can only be found on Catalina Island. For this reason, we made sure to include some of these rare species in our project to hopefully support their ability to continue thriving in this ecosystem. After our offsite background research on the ecologies and histories on Catalina Island, we wanted to gain a more holistic understanding of the Green Ravine test plot. We started this process by listening to the site, engaging various stakeholders, and using different methods to study the landscape. We engaged diverse stakeholders from historians and hydrologists to native plant experts. These interviews were integral to build a project that utilized interdisciplinary knowledge and placed co-learning at the heart of landscape design. It was also important to ground ourselves on the island we did this by getting on site and going on a very beautiful hike, as you can see on the right, learning about the water needs on the island and taking note of our observations while we were on the land. Our class projects involve things like mind mapping, compiling photo montages, and creating inventory diagrams of the test plot. Finally, we produced a series of drawings that synthesized our learning. We drew visualizations of the current plants that were in the test plot both native and invasive. We also collaboratively designed planting plans over the course of two weeks, revisiting and tweaking until we reached a common design that was not just focused on the plants, but also centered on the history, water needs, stewardship, and monitoring of the Green Ravine. Throughout our project, we were given a multitude of opportunities for development. The first one being access to a premier science facility and education opportunities. The long-term staff on Catalina is dedicated to the endurance and success of the Green Ravine. And with that, they completed a test rock check dam, which we improved upon and built multiples of during our early November install. While working with the Catalina Island Conservancy, we were also able to curate the native plant palette to include not only species native to Southern California, but also ones endemic specific to Catalina Island. Test plot is a model for resilient institutional landscapes. In contrast to the typical educational landscape, the Green Ravine breaks free from the arduous bill of fitting into a single aesthetic. Responding to the specific weather patterns on the island, the design was tailored to the goals of survival and resilience rather than a copy and paste of green lawns and palm trees you see throughout Southern California. Overall, test plot is a study. We integrate lessons learned from previous plots in order to ensure the success of the Green Ravine, and we update the task of land maintenance into an art form. We introduce the community to landscape. Although the Green Ravine is located on a private landscape, through volunteering efforts, free travel opportunities, and a communication-based network, we made our site available to several people who would have never had the opportunity to visit previously. Going forward, each semester, students from USC Dornsife, the College of Environmental Studies, will have a class that visits the Wrigley campus to continue monitoring efforts in the direction of excess metal discharge into the Green Ravine's watershed. On our first visit to the island, we met with Lauren to discuss our shared goals for the performance of the test plot. Lauren, let us know about the role the Green Ravine plays in managing the watershed on this part of the island. A common problem with box canyons in Southern California, naturally occurring heavy metals are washed into the ocean, lowering the quality of the water in the cove when tested. 
Lauren has been managing this by constructing dams to slow the water as it travels through the ravine, giving it more time to sink into the earth and absorb those heavy metals before they drain into the protected marine sanctuary. Invasive species such as fennel and ice plant threaten the native plants growing on the island. These aggressive weeds were removed from the site by a volunteer team prior to planting day. In order to give this landscape a chance to thrive rather than die out, we wanted to establish alternatives to the more resource intensive maintenance practices commonly used on mainland institutional campuses. To prevent the spread of weeds, four mats were placed around the base of the new plants. The drip irrigation lines use collected rainwater to water the young plants during the crucial establishment period. The design process began with a focus on the objectives of the test plot. We asked questions about aspirations, challenges, desired features, and site assets. Teams were formed to formulate tests and design recommendations covering stewardship, history, culture, monitoring, planting, and water. The next steps involved identifying the design principles and creating the planting plan to address them. Utilizing earlier plant research and collaborating with the Catalina Conservancy Nursery, we compiled a plant list consisting exclusively of native plants from the Catalina Island. From the above exercises and looking at the existing conditions, it was clear that we wanted to create two types of experiences in this test plot. The first was a dense native plant patch that we could use as a habitat garden and remediation zone for the soil and water. The other was an experimental garden that people could enjoy. This site would have fragrant and flowering species. The bridge seemed to be the best dividing line. We were also cognizant of the location of trees and positioned them away from the buildings, mainly in the experiential zone or in the middle of the rehabilitation zone to avoid any fire disasters. We also identified, with the help of Lauren, two vital points where we need to build drop check dams. These dams would help slow down the water so that the plants could collect excess minerals and metals from the water. Pulling all of this together, we developed a final planting plan that was based around the drip irrigation lines. So what did we want to achieve by converting the green ravine to a test plot? We wanted to create a site where we could test stewardship, sustainable water practices, native plant establishment and maintenance, as well as monitoring. After 12 weeks of planning, interviewing and design, we made our test plot plans a reality and got into the weeds, pun intended, of planting our landscape garden in the green ravine. To be able to face the daunting task of planning around 175 plants, building rock check dams, and installing a drip irrigation system, we relied on a rotating group of around 40 volunteers, students, professors, friends, and collaborators. In three days, we fostered an engaged volunteering team through a fun itinerary designed around our collective goal of a thoughtfully designed green ravine landscape. Together, we built a garden that simultaneously boasts a diverse and beautiful array of native flora, offers new scientific insight with ease of access to monitoring, and also effectively filters soil erosion caused by water flow before it makes its way downstream to the marine protected area of the Fisherman Cove. During the first day of our group of volunteers, they set up the planting site and found creative ways around the unexpected challenges of cement remnants from the center's sheep farming days by finding better areas within the ravine to dig and also using augers and rock chip equipment to reclaim the rocky soil. On day two, the next round of volunteers worked in pairs to get the majority of the plants in the ground and formed a water by gauge to make sure every plant was watered. On day three, they finished the rest of planting, installed drip irrigation system, and began tagging all the new saplings. Altogether, our project successfully resulted in the planting of 175 Catalina native plants, the creation of two new rock check dams, and installed 300 feet of irrigation. We ordered 300 core mats for weed suppression and introduced the island to around 17 volunteers. We also conducted a bioblitz study for future baseline monitoring with a foundation of 53 observation, 17 species, and 52 identification. After our three days of planting and putting in an irrigation system, we have some next steps in mind to keep our plot thriving. Maintaining the plot and keeping the plants alive and healthy requires special attention and care. Watering, weeding, and monitoring needs to happen to ensure the plants successfully grow into adulthood. As volunteers will only be able to make it to our plot on Catalina for planned occasions, our partners located on the island are key stewards of the Green Ravine. Through our collaboration with the Wrigley Institute, staff will assist in maintaining the plot weekly and ensuring the irrigation system runs smoothly. USC Environmental Studies classes will come to the Wrigley Institute at least four times a year to learn about monitoring strategies and help our plot in the process. The Catalina Island Conservancy and Test Plot interns will continue to come out and provide guidance to keep endemic species healthy as we continue soil and box canyon monitoring. 
With additional funding from Pano Days, we would be able to provide equipment and tools for environmental science students to continue monitoring the test plot. We intend to expand this project to plant more plants in the lower part of the ravine, as this initial plot was located in the upper part of the ravine. After learning about our most successful outcomes for stormwater quality improvement, future test plot cohorts will be able to use that knowledge to expand down the ravine. Additionally, with your sport, we will be able to add signage at our Green Ravine site so that passersby have the opportunity to scan a QR code and get involved. This will also help people visiting the Wrigley Institute to recognize and identify the plot so it can be integrated into the different educational programs, pedagogies, and retreats that take place when classes visit. On Catalina, we are creating a model and building evidence through science and monitoring for institutions to transition resource-intensive landscapes to resilient community-building conservation projects. Current paradigms of landscape management need to be more sustainable in order to mitigate climate change impacts. The failure of manicured landscapes lawns on Catalina we took as an opportunity to design and implement a new model, by collecting data and sharing our findings, our test plot is a microcosm of resilient landscaping and restoration in California and beyond. The potential support from Pando Days would allow our test plot to produce a zine, a small publication about the lessons learned from this test plot that would hopefully help other groups to build and replicate the stewardship model we are building across institutions in the Southland. We invite you to invest in the ongoing land conservation and collaborative stewardship through test plot. Thank you for your time and consideration. All right. Wonderful job. I'm so glad that you got into the weeds with this. <laughs> I think part of what we can really learn from is the really robust process that was shared. But, you know, I think from my perspective, just seeing that legacy is built into this and thinking about the longevity of the stewardship of the space is super inspiring to see. Um, I do want to throw it over to our guest experts who are here to give some feedback, ask some questions, et cetera. We've got two wonderful people with us today, Sam Stevenson and Andy Schrader. Sam is an associate principal with Burrow Happel, the engineering film that or firm that essentially wrote the LA County possible sustainability plan, which Pando Days projects align. Bureau Happold is also a distinguished Pando Day sponsor. And Andy Schrader is a Pandomaniac, our loving term, from way back, having helped us with strategic advice as early as 2014 for Pando, when uh, the organization was just getting off of the ground. And you'll know him for being the chief environmental aide for LA City Council member, Paul Koretz, uh, when he was in office. Andy now operates his own consulting firm out of the Bay Area, but with continuing deep involvement in L.A. So we welcome you, Andy and Sam. And Sam, why don't we start with you, uh, you know, as an engineer who specializes in taking a creative vision and giving it that needed infrastructure to deliver it. You know, I'm sure that you have a lot of thoughts kind of going through your mind in seeing this project and all of the thinking. So if you wouldn't mind sharing some, uh, that would be wonderful. Sure. I mean, I think the first thing I'll say is that it's very frustrating to listen to a presentation where you have a bunch of questions that you're coming up and as you go through, they're all being answered one by one. So I've had to cross off a bunch of my questions because I think you actually covered them, which is terrific. Um, I, I think uh, a few things that, that come to mind, uh, I think one of the one of the things that I do, I do think you answered this a little bit is about how you take the what you've developed here that is, is quite site specific and think about uh, that how that could be adopted more uh, more widely into other sites. How do you develop something that you're going to be able to um, present back to USC or to Catalina residents, and to be able to say, well, this is how you know we could apply, apply this on other sites, which you did mention. I think uh, one of the other technical questions I'm, I'm interested in is. You have a drip irrigation system, and I wondered uh, whether there much thought had been given to uh, shifting away from irrigation and actually going to uh, an, like a, a non-irrigated plant base. Uh, and the other thing is is thinking about where that irrigation water comes from and whether there is opportunities to capture some of that stormwater and, and, and reuse some of that. Great questions. I, I would love to give my students an opportunity to answer any of these if they'd like to take a stab at them. We've got a couple on here um, and I can fill in any blanks. Um, let's. Did, would, would anyone like to take a stab at the application to other sites or do you want to punt it back to me? I'm, I'm willing to 
All right, Paige. Hi. Um, so yeah, well, um, thank you for your time today. And I'll try and answer these questions, you know, as best as I can. Um, so one of the things within the land stewardship that we're trying to uh, make as a model is the integration of community and volunteers. Um, one of the ways that we did this especially is providing the free transportation, which is uh, can be a barrier to access for a lot of different sites. Um, and then uh, with the irrigation, Alex can correct me if I'm wrong, um, but I believe it was rainwater captured. We have, it was like a 250 gallon tote that we placed uphill um, for the irrigation lines and it has a manual on and off switch. So we actually didn't have to turn it on initially because of the um, rainwater event that came on. And hopefully we won't have to really use it if the um, the rainy season continues the way that it is. Um, so it's there kind of as a backup to ensure the uh, during especially the first two years for the plants to be um, uh, like initiated into the site, you know, because we did do native plants. Yeah. They uh, just required that initial extra rainwater um, in the beginning. Yeah. And then um, especially also one of the other um, kind of land stewardship uh, practices that we're hoping to replicate and uh, we kind of touched on was moving away from the typical like aesthetic landscape of Southern California which is like the turf or the grass lawns with the palm trees um, we really wanted to focus on how using native plants and creating a palette around them can be beautiful in itself and showing that to people um, and showing how it can be replicated and um, some of the tests that we were doing were not only getting the uh, metal out of the soil, and so we're testing for that um, over uh, every quarter um, going forward with the class that's going back onto the site, um, but then also seeing um, the relationships that can be built between two plants that might not be found together and seeing um, how they can create like a homogeneous uh, native site for different uh, like host animals. Yeah. I'll just add one thing as a great answer page. I just the one thing that to test plot likes to say is like one size doesn't fit all. So we don't think that there's the right solution. We're we're not making a perfect model for every place like that. But I think I think we are creating a process, and um, that is helpful and useful. And we are you know learn we are learning lessons that can be applied to other sites. And so one thing that um, so we we went through a process of listening that led into this final project. I think that's what needs to happen, all these projects, and also is a great community building process. But the um, there are going to be some lessons that we get because we're working in this, you know, science institution, and we have these great connections to the university on this test plot that we don't have in other test plots. So we we hope to build some, some evidence about different kinds of methods of planting or establishment, um, stormwater, et cetera, et cetera. Great. I think it's so important that you've got these amazing lessons, uh, lessons that you guys have learned about how to do this, because um, I think it, it is so important that that we are moving away from, as you say, these manicured lawns and these very water intensive designs in Southern California that do not make sense. Um, so, I, you know, I really would love to see see how this can be, uh, you know, widened to, to so many, so many more sites. Thank you, Sam. And let's throw it to Andy for any comments or a question. Uh, first of all, you know, thank you USC for uh, for joining in with with Piano Days. We're excited to have you, and uh, it's so important to be doing this work uh, and and helping implement the the, the excellent uh, LA County Sustainability Plan. And and thanks to Bureau Happold for all its work on on that as well. Um, I I love Catalina Islands, one of my favorite places on Earth, and so thank you for letting me be there uh, at least mentally for a few minutes. Uh, and, and I'm excited about this project. Uh, so I have a few questions. You, you made a pretty big point of uh, uh, locating in space uh, the the Tongva people. Have you engaged with the Tongva people in, in this project um, and engaged with them in that? Maybe I can answer this question because it was something that we explored at the beginning before the students got involved. Um, we are... We, we attempted to do that and um, we I think we're kind of um, the, the our liaison Wrigley decided that they would want it, they wanted to wait. Um, and so we uh, are hopefully hopeful that we can do that in the future and we're interested in doing that. And that was something that we were we were sort of self-critical about that we didn't achieve that. 
Um, but that's something that we aspire to. I think now that maybe we've shown a commitment to this space um, and and built a relationship with Wrigley and the Conservancy, we can hopefully move forward with some connection there. But one of the things we wanted to do was think about it, including some of their uh, important plants in the indigenous in indigenous plants in the experiential garden. And we also were um, very much inspired by the fact that all of our landscapes that we consider natural were really quite manic they're they're managed by indigenous people. So there's always been a form of stewardship in our natural landscapes. There's no kind of raw nature out there that's an illusion. There's always been someone there taking care of our landscape. So that kind of active stewardship in a native landscape is something that inspires the whole test plot project. Yeah, we uh, as we were developing the the LA City Biodiversity uh, Index, and if any of you have haven't uh, had the chance to to take a look at it, I'll I'll put it in the in the chat. Um, I learned a lot about from from our our amazing local scientists around the city um, the, about biodiversity in terms of it, it's almost impossible to uh, call it native biodiversity since. As Alex mentioned, it's it's been stewarded by indigenous people for what seven thousand years, um, and, and so you know it gets into what's native, what's not native, what, um, and so those are 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 tricky questions as you're doing this kind of work. Um, I'm curious where you source the plants and the seeds uh, that you're going to be using for this. Anyone want to grab that question? Easy question. Sure, I can. Um, so we partnered with the Catalina Island Conservancy, which is a local group on the island. And through that partnership, they were able to provide the plants and um, some of the seeds as well. So that was really a great partnership. Um, I that's, can add that's great. to that. Since it was a native restoration work, uh, they were really excited to be a part of this. And they've been doing such work uh, somewhere else on the island, but then having it being done with like Wrigley and USC uh, on a larger scale was something that got them really, really excited. Uh, that's great. Um, and totally- oh, Olivia, totally, totally, did, you, yep. did you wanna add something? Sure. Um, I just wanted to add that the Conservancy is a pretty like established group on the island, and they actually have a nursery that's more inland where they um, grow these plants. So they have a large nursery, and they do a lot of work with seed saving, um, and really like saving them from the island and protecting like endemic species because it's hard to source them, um, the ones that are like endemic to the island. Um, so all of the plants are like more resistant, and they really put an emphasis on um care for that nursery yeah. cool that that's actually exactly what i was looking for um the uh it, you mentioned in the in the um uh, presentation naturally occurring heavy metals and, and i was trying to listen closely i was having a little trouble hearing um th so they're naturally part of the island is that accurate can somebody talk to that a little bit yeah, I can talk about that really quick. Um, so one of the people that we um, coordinated a lot with um, was a staff member at Wrigley who um, is a hydrologist. And she was basically telling us that she's talked a lot with the regional water board and basically the entire watershed um, north of the campus um, has really high levels of naturally occurring heavy metals in the soil. Um, so it's not like it's coming from like a point source with Wrigley, but when rain happens, it washes through the ravine and then into the MPA, the marine protected area. Um, so that is like a concern for the water board, um, just because having like big rain events being more frequent um, nowadays, unfortunately, um, it's really hard to mitigate like that flow. And then when it goes to the MPA, there's specific regulations and it's not good for marine wildlife. Um, so even though they are naturally occurring, um, some of these processes like increase rain frequency and then, um, you know, the ve current vegetation on the island may not be so natural. Um, so we're just really trying to mitigate that 
um, with the ravine and the planting and the two and the three rock check downs that we have there. Yeah, that was, that was kind of the the where I was headed with this is if you remove the heavy metals from the natural system, what impact will that have on the overall biodiversity and the plants and animals? And it, will that be a negative impact? Um, and as the water board talked about that or thought about that. Um, I think it won't have a negative, it will have a positive impact on marine life um, because it shouldn't really naturally be going into this cove. Um, but in terms, in terms of terrestrial, I think the idea of spreading out the water, um, like when it comes down from the watershed into like the land below, um, I don't necessarily think it will have too much of an impact um, because it, the idea is to like cover a greater surface area. I don't know if Alex or anyone can add on to that. Well, one thing I'll note is, yeah, we don't really know, the, wa the water board should probably make an exception here because of the naturally occurring soils and probably should change some of their standards. But I think Olivia really made a good remark in the sense that like things have been altered in a lot of other ways that regardless if that is not an issue, the heavy metals, we've got a channel that's been disturbed by sheep farming. So actually when we dug in, we found concrete about six inches down sometimes and we had to jackhammer it out. So this is a really heavily altered stream that's been mowed down and kind of abused for 50, 100 years. Uh, and so we would have definitely improve the water quality throughout the system and also re, re sort of start the, the, the native ecologies in the ravine. One thing we noticed is that since the, the, the first check dam went in, they've had a lot of native grasses actually coming out of the ravine. So it started to like restart the ecology without any, in, any intervention. But um, yeah, there's a there's a there's a deeper dive to go into like what what really is the impact of these heavy metals if they're naturally occurring, um, and have the plants and animals and fish and marine life uh, uh, evolved to use them as part of their living systems? Uh, that's kind of my question. It's possible. It's also possible that this has always been a less productive area because of that too. We don't really, um, I don't know if we know the answer, but I do think it's probably pretty clear i would i would guess it's conclusive that the heavy metals are not helping a lot of the animals there um but i don't i'm not sure all right well everyone we we should start to wrap up this is a really great conversation we could be talking about this for a long time i think evident in just the depth of the process and thoughtfulness of the work as well i do want to use that as a way to say thank you to the usc team for all of your your work on this and of course, thank you to Andy and Sam for your feedback and for your questions today as well. This is the end for this session, but at this point, we are actually uh, have seen 10 of the 16 projects that will be developed this season. So we've got six left to go. Hopefully folks can join us tomorrow uh, morning for at 10 a.m. for an entire morning of presentations, beginning with two projects from Cal State Long Beach, a project from Cal State Fullerton, and then our first entry from Orange County uh, coming from Cal State Fullerton, which is worth noting. And then also UCLA will be participating. Thank you to all of the Pando Days colleges and universities that have dedicated full courses, studios, or labs to help LA County meet these sustainability goals. Pando Days was conceived in collaboration with LA's Chief Sustainability Officer uh, Task Force and is in partnership with the county's Chief Sustainability Office. Uh, so Pando Days is made possible by the support of our sponsors. We want to give them a big thanks and by generous contributions from individuals across the Southland and beyond. Thank you everybody for enjoying, for joining with us. I was gonna say for enjoying with us, which also would be accurate. Uh, and I hope that everybody has a great rest of your day. Thank you everybody. <laughs>